Welcome, welcome back to the Work Podcast. Uh, we are so, so freaking excited to be here with the amazing Leah Thomas. Um, Leah, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, before we get, you know, really into it, I just want to share with our audience a little bit about who you are, uh, what you're about, your origin story, and how you got into environmentalism, especially in regards to the intersectionality of it. Absolutely. So yeah, I love the phrase origin story because it makes me think of like comic books and like Marvel movies and that just makes me really happy. Um, But yeah, I didn't know that I wanted to be an environmentalist and I don't think it was until maybe at some point in my 20s I realized, oh, I guess I've always really loved the earth and so does my mom and my grandmother and it's kind of just a tradition that was passed on because my family were a very big agricultural family we have gardens and things like that so looking back on my life I spent a lot of time outside kind of just playing in the midwest and outdoors and then I think later on I noticed oh, okay there's actually ecosystems ecology and environmentalism and this is so cool but when I was cultivating that love for the earth and science, I also was really passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, back in the day, I didn't call it that. I didn't call it DEI or JEDI or whatever. I just knew that I liked being Black and my family was, you know, just a very proud Black family. So I wanted to take that with me everywhere. Um, And that included within my environmental studies, but I was the only Black student in my classroom, but I knew that there were different interpretations of how people cared for the earth because I saw my family, like I said, um, that loved the earth and cultivated it in their own way, but there wasn't a lot of representation of people of color in the environmental space. So I really just wanted to shake things up however I could and also with various social justice movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, I knew certainly then that I couldn't separate the advocacy of Black people and people of color from my environmental practice. So I started writing about it, blogging about it, and then, you know, somehow it became a thing. I'm probably skipping over a couple parts of that journey, but thankfully because of social media, and a couple people listening to me posting about intersectional theory and feminism and how that connected with environmentalism, intersectional environmentalism kind of became an official concept, which is so, so cool. And I just feel very humbled and it's, it's awesome. There's a nonprofit, there's a book I just wrote, and I have a really wonderful team of really great people. Wow. I love that. I, your your family worked um, in agriculture, just gardening and stuff. You were brought into that very early on. Yeah, I would say, I guess with my family, as far as I know it, um, I guess, you know, I've done DNA tests and things like that, but we are an African-American family. So a lot of our history is also kind of tied up in um, slavery in the United States and the agricultural practices um, and tending to the land that so many Black folks were doing um, in the so-called United States. And as my family coming from the South, that's just kind of a part of, you know, our history, but then reclaiming that for ourselves and gardening and tending to the land. And that's something that I remember my grandfather in Arkansas doing on his farm. Uh, My great grandmother that I got to grow up with tasting tomatoes in her garden. And then both of my grandparents are really, really passionate about tending to the land. So it's a part of my family history. And I'm so glad how they've reclaimed that for themselves. It doesn't just stop um, at the trauma. But you know, there's a beautiful history of Black agriculture in this country that isn't often talked about. Mm -hmm. Wow. I want to actually ask a question that just came to me as you were speaking. Um, I feel like that also extends to the ancestry back to Africa because I was just reading that a lot of the um, reason why they colonized West Africa was because they were engineers and they were very... um, how do I say this, like astute at like farming and growing their plants. And then because of that knowledge, that's why they brought them to the United States. So I feel like that also ties into your ancestral roots and your history and how you're even connected back to your ancient ancestors. Um, 
yeah there was absolutely a statement yeah. <laughs> no that's such a it's such a beautiful thing that I want to maybe write about and explore a little bit more that like my history and black identity in terms of agriculture and caring for the land in a very sustainable way is almost innate for a lot of black cultures and even just communities of color around the world. And even if we're looking at agriculture in the United States, the system that we have right now is unsustainable. Um, it's very extractive of the land filled with pesticides, but that's not my history. That's not the way that my ancestors cared for the land. And I think returning to many of those cultural and ancestral practices can actually be a really great solution for some of the environmental issues that we face now. So that's what makes me feel very confident about um, being a Black environmentalist because that's my history, that's my DNA, that's my, you know, ancestry, and that's what my people have known for a very long time. So yeah, that empowerment piece, I think, is really important to the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Your your account was the first time I saw intersectional environmentalists. Can you define what that means for you? Yeah, so it's funny how these things kind of came together, but when I was in college, I learned about intersectional theory and intersectional feminism, and it was really because I went to a predominantly white university in Orange County, and I was one of the only Black students, so I remember I tried to get involved in the women's movement in college, but in a very white space as a Black woman, when I was going to school during Ferguson, during uh, kind of the beginnings of the Black Lives Matter movement, I was kind of wondering why people weren't talking about racial justice within some of those feminist spaces. It didn't make sense because um, I don't know, like my blackness is so intertwined with my womanhood. I can't separate the two. So that's how I remember someone she was white, but she was very woke. She did the work. Um, and she was like, have you heard about Kimberly Crenshaw? Because, you know, intersectional feminism doesn't, you know, it's not just white feminism. It's advocating for women of color. It's exploring the ways that things like race and religion and spirituality or, you know, gender identity, sexuality, whatever it is, and how those things also connect to, you know, feminism and the concept of like womanhood or whatever. Um, so I thought intersectional theory was so cool. I finally felt seen for the first time that, okay, it doesn't have to just be one or the other. Like I can be a racial justice advocate while also being a feminist and those things for me intertwine and they do for so many people. So when I found intersectional feminism, it made sense that, okay, yes, I want to be a part. I want to be a feminist. I want to be a black feminist. This makes sense. Um, and then I wanted the same thing with environmentalism because I was finding a lot of environmental organizations that were passionately advocating for saving the whales and they were passionately advocating about specific environmental issues, but it didn't make sense to me that there wasn't an advocacy for people um, on this planet who are also animals and should, we're, we're living, it just, it made no sense. So I just thought, okay, intersectional theory should be applied to environmentalism. Um, oftentimes we see the concept of environmental justice, which is social justice plus environmentalism, that's often kind of siloed as a different type of environmentalism. And the argument with adding intersectional theory to environmentalism is that environmental justice shouldn't be siloed. Any environmental work should think about people, planet and animals at the same time because they're all connected and it shouldn't be separated. So that's what it is in essence, just really considering the compounding factors when you're talking to any environmental issue. You can't talk about saving the trees without also talking about how they purify our earth and the air that we breathe, and then which communities even have the right to breathe clean air in every sense of that word. So yeah, got to take it one step two steps, three steps deeper with an intersectional environmentalism. Isn't it interesting that to include uh, marginalized people and just all people in general, um, it becomes this like special topic, right? It becomes this, like, like you said, this like siloed different form of, as opposed to the all encompassing like thing. I've always found that really odd that we do that. Um, I don't know why we exclude each other and why we, I mean, well, we know why white supremacy, but, but why we highlight the white experience as the experience. Um, 
and as someone who has had this experience a lot like not alongside you but in addition to you you know i wonder if people realize how harmful it is because that does in fact create a new trauma if we're all advocating for the same thing and then when all of us marching together are are taking a moment to reflect on it, we realize that the majority of the group doesn't consider the rest of the group. You know, it just is like, I don't know, it's something that when listening to your story, I really felt because I feel like mainstream um, activism, it's centered on loving and it's centered on inclusivity and yet it isn't that in actuality that was yeah. just a statement there wasn't a question in there <laughs> no I feel like too there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that I feel like I've had just like are people seeing this and they are like we are seeing it but it makes absolutely no sense I don't know I mean I'm very thankful for the opportunities that I have had but sometimes I just in the back of my head think it's the most obvious and genuine thing that if you care for the earth, you should care for its people. And that also means caring for its people that aren't being treated fairly. And I think there's just a lot of people that don't want to see that piece. I think after the quote unquote racial awakening of 2020, more people were inclined to think about it for, you know, whatever their reasoning may have been. Um, but yeah, it's just a long way to go. And even when we're thinking about movements that were progressive for their time. So when we're thinking about um, like feminist movements of the 60s or the 70s or the 50s, whenever um, in history where, okay, we have a group of women, primarily white, straight women advocating for women's rights, and yet they are being violently racist towards women of color. They're being very transphobic. They're being very homophobic, et cetera. And this is this concept that I talk about in the book called lateral oppression that often happens even within marginalized groups of people where even like if there's a little bit of power that you feel like you have um, over another marginalized group, even as you're advocating for your liberation, you might not want to take other people with you. And that's the complete opposite of intersectional theory. And in intersectional theory, I feel like it's posing the question, like, what if we worked together instead of siloing ourselves even further? Because that happens time and time again, even in um, the early gay rights movement, um, where they prioritize, you know, white voices and they really deprioritize trans voices and the voices of um, queer folks of color, et cetera. That's happened even in the civil rights movement where there are a lot of incredible black women. And that's where we even get intersectional theory because black feminists of their time felt like they weren't being listened to in the civil rights movement. So it keeps happening over and over in different ways until we you know, acknowledge it and address it when it comes up. I'm very, I'm very active on TikTok. I have like a borderline obsession. And <laughs> about, about a couple months ago, there were, I think there were climate scientists, but they were white men who like chained themselves to uh, JP Morgan because JP Morgan has been funding these uh, oil rigs in the Amazon or what, whatever. And yeah. Then all of a sudden, people on TikTok were like, oh, my God, the climate crisis and like <laughs> making this like sense of urgency, like that we're going to die. The planet's dying. And then I was watching all of these um, BIPOC creators like re replying against that, saying like, we're, we've been here this whole time talking about this, like because marginalized people and poor people are the ones who are affected by climate change first. And, but again, like the filter of information always goes through the, like the white filter, specifically if you're a white man. Um, and it was just like the sense of urgency from like um, the fragility of like, oh my God, what's happening? Meanwhile, this is happening the whole time. I mean, that's what's been happening with um, the abortion rights. Anyway, um, I'm very passionate as you could tell. Um, <laughs> But you have this huge platform through Instagram and you wrote a book about this. How are you able to kind of like 
put yourself out there into the spotlight and people you're know, like you're on Vogue. Like, how were you able to do that? Um, Ooh, I don't know. I really, cause there's so much frustration and honestly, I think it's good to be very transparent. It is so annoying, frustrating, saddening, maddening when like, I don't know, the Black Lives Matter movement, even by the time we got to 2020, we can look back, I guess the uprisings of Ferguson after um, the shooting of Michael Brown, I think that was 2014, 2015. If that was 2014, that was six years of the first time we saw like the Black Lives Matter hashtag start to populate on Twitter. It was like 2013, 2016, starting to make these micro communities. That's six years until the quote unquote racial awakening of 2020. And it's so exhausting that, and even environmental justice as a movement started in 1980. So it's been such a long time of people screaming at the top of their lungs. And it is really frustrating when people finally catch up, um, white people mm, finally catch up. <laughs> but it's also, I would say, <laughs> I mean, it is really frustrating and then it's, it's not, but then I think what keeps me going is realizing that it's not just ignorant white folks. Um, I remember I tweeted um, not too long ago, maybe a year ago, like, did you know that 70 plus percent of African-Americans live in counties that are in violation of federal air quality standards? And like, that's why so many of us have asthma. Like, it's not just because we're black as they position it sometimes. And I remember tweeting that and it had like thousands and thousands of retweets. And there were a couple, you know, environmental professionals, like, of course I need that information. I have access to the EPA. And I'm like, well, apparently the people don't. So I don't know, like I, I wanted to not, I wanted to resist any snobbery that tends to happen in academia and go, there's a million reasons why people don't know. Um, it could be they're working to survive. Like they don't have, some people just don't have time to get into the nitty gritty of environmental issues. So I try to assume positive intent as much as I can and just break things down at the 101 level because I just want as many people to understand as possible. Um, so I don't know, I guess I just, I get really annoyed, but I just know, okay, even if I know, even if I think people should have known five years ago, there's things that I'm learning right now um, that I didn't know a year ago. So if I can help some people get hip to these intersections, that's what I'm going to do. And right now I'm just writing at kind of like a 101 level for anyone who wants to join, but who knows, maybe a couple years from now, I can start writing about other things as well. But I try to not be too judgmental and just meet people where they're at, but behind closed doors, like I said, I do get frustrated at times. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say you do that very well because um, I feel when I post and when I write, my frustration is felt. Um, but the way you present it is so palatable, but also very clear. And that is that I have to say that is really hard to find that fine line. So kudos to you. I mean, really, there is no judgment in, or frustration in your tone at all. It's just like, did you know? Please learn this. You know? well, I think because the mission is greater than, I think you have to remember your intention and like the mission is to get everybody on board, um, I, which is what I'm taking from what you said, because yeah, sometimes like I'm literally like, how did you not know that? Like, how did you not figure that out? But what you just said really helped me because we, the, it doesn't matter. Like I need to get over that sometimes and remember like we need to get everybody on board. Yeah, and it gets frustrating because sometimes I think like, okay, like who is consuming the work that I do? And I think hmm, a large part of it, maybe even half of it is like white folks and maybe that's even people who are listening to your podcast, like who want to get hip. They like, they want to do the work and it's like stuff that they maybe should have learned a while ago, hopefully, but they're here. We're happy show up, you know, but then I had to remember that's not like my only audience, even if that was 70%, there's also like a really healthy amount of folks that I'm writing for who are just, I don't know the part that gets me excited, like other black women or other women of color who are like, oh my God, yes, this is how I felt when I was in my classroom, or this is how I felt when I was working at this environmental nonprofit or, oh, intersectional theory. I had no no idea this was the origins of like black feminism in the United States. I feel seen, I feel heard. So I think that's the audience that I really, really care about. I mean, I care about all of them, but that's what keeps me doing this work because 
it's almost like I'm writing for my younger self. I wish when I was in my first environmental classroom, there was like a book with a rainbow on it. My book that was like, ha, ah, like here <laughs> is what <laughs> you are missing. You don't have to separate your identity from environmentalism, like go forth and be you and love the earth. Um, so that's what keeps me happy because I just want someone to feel like seen and heard and represented um, in what I'm doing. Can you speak to that? Because um, there are people of color in the environmental movement, but you know, like you said in your your Vogue article, like we're not we're not featured or highlighted, you know, in in the retelling of the story. And and I would love for you to just touch on on what that means and and how we are actually all involved. Yeah. Oh my God. The history of people of color and environmentalism is vast. And it's like we were talking about earlier, even if we're looking at global agricultural traditions around the world, um, but it's something like indigenous folks protect over 80% of the world's biodiversity, even though they're less than like 10% of the world's population. Um, so indigenous folks, people of color globally, like are the OG environmentalists white environmentalists, conservationists, et cetera, in my opinion, learned what conservation is just based on the ways that so many people of color around the world were already protecting the earth. But it's not talked about that because many of the textbooks aren't written by us. So it kind of starts with this odd kind of colonial like uh, exploration of the West and the formation of national parks, not really telling the true history about the displacement of people or that, you know, environmental history doesn't just start with white explorers going to places where POC already were. So I feel like that's why we're written out of stories because our books aren't sometimes like core to environmental curriculums and something that makes me happy is that gen z especially is demanding more in their education whether it's public schools or beyond they're sharing these stories on tiktok to the point where they're asking their teachers like why am i not learning about the father of environmental justice like dr robert bullard an incredible black researcher why this is crucial to my education. So I guess what we're seeing now that gets me excited is that curriculums are being updated to include Dr. Robert Bullard has written like 16 books, like pick one, put it in the curriculum. <laughs> so many friends of mine have written incredible books or who doesn't want to learn about a really cool 100 year old black park ranger named Betty Reed Soskin. Like there's so many great stories that could be added to environmental curriculums. Um, and yeah, they haven't been just because we haven't been writing some of the textbooks that are being used, but I feel like that is being changed. You've been a park ranger. I was an intern. I have to preface that. I was an intern. I was a park ranger intern. <laughs> I know. What did you think? Did you love it? How was it? I was in a very particular park. So I was on one in rural Kansas. It was a historic site. Um, so we had like zero to two visitors on a day on average. So I really was just like kicking it in the farms. Um, and then my second time I was helping with White House tours because park rangers are part of it. And it was during the last year of Obama's presidency. So that was a really great experience. Um, but yeah, I had really untraditional park experiences. Um, I got to help with White House protests, which I think was cool. It is your right to protest in front of the White House, but the park rangers are there to make sure it doesn't get too, too rowdy. So I had, yeah, a great time as a park ranger. That Thank you for so saying that. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just going to say, I learned on TikTok, by the way, like <laughs> the colonial, the colonial ways in which the national parks were formed in the United States. And I was like, no, not that too. <laughs> Why does everything have to be that? Um, but, and then before I learned that though, I also wanted to be a national park park ranger because I just thought it was like such a cool job. Um, but then when you mentioned the Obama thing, I went to um, tour the White House the last year of his presidency. So I'm wondering if like you were there at the same time, maybe. <laughs> if it was during the summer, I was there. I was working Monday through Friday. Um, but yeah, that's so yeah, it was such a great time. And people don't know. I mean, there's a lot of it, that's the complicated thing with history. Like there's so many cool stories. Black history within the Park Service, but then it also has 
a not so great history, but I learned a lot about Buffalo soldiers that were park rangers and Sequoia and Yosemite. And it's just like, ugh, I just wish this should be foundational to environmental history in the U.S. And I hope moving forward it can be because there's some really cool stories, especially in the historic sites, um, because oftentimes people think about Yosemite, etc. But there's over like I don't know, like a hundred or so national historic sites that talk about historic events and yeah, people should check them out. Yeah. I, I just learned recently the the meaning of Yosemite um, means killers in um, the indigenous language, because um, obviously there was like a great battle there where the colonizers were trying to take this land and um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but the indigenous people kept yelling Yosemite, 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 which means killers and the colonizers thought like it was the name of the land. So they named it Yosemite. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. It's not funny, but it's like, not everything is about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like kangaroo, right? That's how kangaroos got their name some in a very similar way. It's like, I think the, and, um, Aboriginal people were saying, I don't know what you're saying. And that's what kangaroo means or something like oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll get serious for a moment. Um, so obviously like legislation and policy change is like really integral to environmentalism and intersectional environmentalism and the ways in which we move forward with how we um, live equitably on this planet. Um, can you speak more about that and how you get more involved in that way? Yeah, I think policy is something that I've struggled with. And I think especially in the last couple of weeks, I get why people don't vote. Um, I think for a really long time, I was trying to hold on and I was just like voting, the power to change the systems. And at this point, we have a left leaning president, um, you know, majority left leaning in most of the government. And yet we have, um, you know, Supreme Court justices it makes no sense that they have indefinite terms that are making decisions on behalf of all of us. So it really made me sit back and just think, okay, I think I really want to invest in local state uh, government a little bit more because our federal government, there's just so many systems that need to, need to be dismantled. Um, so that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop voting. I'm going to continue to vote federally. But I think if you want to have hope and smile occasionally, getting um, <laughs> involved <laughs> in local policy is like where it's at. So I'm trying to learn more because I've seen community gardens be built because of local policies. Living in California, especially like there's reparations happening because of local policies. There is a, a black uh, town in Huntington Beach, a popular beach here. Do you hear that story? Yeah. And it was yes. you know, yep. decades ago, they were ran out of town. Um, and then the local and state government was like, we need to start talking about climate reparations and like give land back to the descendants. Who would have thought that this multi-million dollar property would be given back to the descendants? Um, who would have thought, you know, there's some local and state policies here in California. It's not perfect, but we have cannabis legislation. Um, we have diversity education is mandatory in our high schools and middle schools when the rest of the country is trying to, you know, have some critical race theory uh, debate. So I think local and state policy get with it people. Um, I want younger and younger people to run for office. I think people underestimate how not competitive some of these positions are. And even just with social media, I believe that Gen Zers and millennials, we can elect our friends who are community members who are doing really incredible things and kind of change our cities um, and work with grassroots organizations. So that's the only hope that I have for policy is local and state, and then maybe federal government will get on board. Wow, that's incredible. Uh. Is that why mm -hmm. California wants to cede from the U.S.? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> wouldn't be opposed, <laughs> right? I'm going. If you, go, I'm going over there. <laughs> I know. I'm like California is looking a lot better, and I heard right. that California has like the second largest economy in the world, or something. 
something it's pretty big our gdp yeah. so or gross domestic whatever that is it's it's bigger it's we're in the top 10 yeah. so like even if california were its own country our gdp would be in the top 10 like highest economies yeah. and it's because mostly because of our agriculture and all like the produce that we're supplying to the rest of the country so i don't know california needs to start putting some sanctions on the u.s if uh, they don't get it together <laughs> And I mean, let's be honest, like because of California's economy, it's probably because we're a union, like it, it supplies to the poorer states as well. So as much as like the red states, like blame the coastal elites, like, I mean, that's why everything's connected, as we said. I I love that you brought up, um, you know, voting in small government or voting in our local government. I think it's incredibly important um we just had our our first election in new york yeah our primaries and um you know it was really important to me that everyone i know or everyone who follows me understand that they have to go out and vote um because i do think that a lot of millennials especially are disenchanted and i'm a i'm a millennial um are disenchanted and um you know, there's this feeling that our vote doesn't matter, especially when it comes to uh, what happens federally, but it's actually not true. And it does start at home and it does start with really getting to know what policies are coming up in your local government and speaking, I mean, uh, speak to your assembly people. Like there's just, there's so many ways to make change. Um, and I think if we just stay excited and stay connected, then we can really create huge waves. So thank you for bringing that up and saying that it's really, really important. Um, (laughs) I want you to to touch on the practice of pleasure and uh, bringing in joy as a form of activism. Yeah, I love this so much. Um, uh, I remember there's someone, uh, I don't focus, I just think it's funny, but you know, there's a lot of drama sometimes on social media. And there's a while ago where someone that I don't really like know. So it's not about the drama, but it was funny. So someone was like making fun of me and they were like, there's someone who is green in her name and she just cares about joy and optimism and like hope. And I was like, okay. (laughs) How dare you? It makes me like laugh so much, but I get where she's coming from or they are coming from because it's like on the surface, sometimes joy can be positioned as something that's surface level or it's a distraction from everything that's going on or there's toxic positivity. There's so much of that, like chill vibes only. I don't want to talk about the bad stuff, but that's not what it is. Like my argument is that joy is revolutionary, actually, especially for people of color, for women women, for people with marginalized identities, overlapping marginalized identities, because this world tries to take away our joy every single day. Um, Our civil liberties are being stripped away from us every single day. So to be able to find joy in spite of that all is one of the most revolutionary things that people can do. And there are some days when joy is in the back of my head. But then I think about, oh my God, like how did my great grandmother who I'm so blessed is, you know, still alive. Like she gets up and she dances every time like uh, Frankie Beverly and Mays or like some song comes on. Like if she can get up and dance and she, you know, survived segregation and the civil rights movement, et cetera, you know, was born to ancestors who were slaves, et cetera. Like then I have no excuse. I need to get up and be joyful when I can. So it's not about, you know, not thinking about the realities and the traumas of the present, but taking a moment. I think finding joy is actually a way to kind of stick it to the man in some ways of saying like, no, you will not take away my smile and being able to find joy in community, people that support you, et cetera. Um, It's so important and crucial to the work that we do um, because, 
Ooh, it's so easy to burn out if there's not some sort of balance. And I think for me, so I'm also a millennial, uh, Gen Z adjacent, but I'm 27. Um, <laughs> and when I talk to younger activists, you know, they're just so serious all the time. And I remember I went to uh, a climate conference in Scotland and I was like, we're going to the club, we're going dancing. And it was so cute to see these like 20 to 22 year olds um, that had like just been protesting since they were 13 having the most fun that they had ever had, just like shaking it on a dance floor in Scotland. And the next day going to a protest with over 20,000 people. Um, But I just wanted them to know that you are more than just your activism. You are a person that's worthy of love and joy and light. And those things don't have to compete. They actually help nourish the other. So that's why joy is really important to the work that I do. Um, And, you know, like TikTok, there's this TikTok audio that's like, the girls that get it, get it. The girls that don't, don't. So if they don't get it, they don't get it. It's fine. (laughs) Did you bring Greta Thurberg to the club? (laughs) She was not in the club with us, but I did meet her and she was very, very nice. (laughs) But she's super intense. I know what you mean. Yeah. And honestly, they all are. And just imagine if you started out as an activist at like six. I'm like, what does that even mean? You know, and uh, going and listening to adults, you're around adults more than kids. Honestly, if you're on like a speaker circuit or something when you're 13, a 13 year old climate activist, and it's not normal for kids to walk out of school every Friday and, you know, think that they urgently need to save their future. And to me, you know, if the world is going to, um, you know, I have hope, but if it's going to be bad, we might as well find joy when we can, because we're going to need that. You know, it breaks my heart to think about children having to protest, protest at the age of six and to start, you know, it's just like, that to me is true, like innocence lost, you know, it's like with this impending fear that, that our world is doomed if we don't do something right away, which, which I mean, it, it is, but just to know that at six and to truly know that in your bones, just, I mean, isn't that heartbreaking? But it's kind yeah. of like that one post that you posted on your Instagram. I posted? Uh, no, posted. Leah posted. Okay. That was like, um, and you know, a lot of the people who we've interviewed had said the same, same sentiment, which was like, we can't just dismantle because then we just be in the hole of everything's evil and what the fuck is the point. But we also have to dream up a post colonial, post capitalist post patriarchal society where it, it's worth living and if we don't have joy now in doing this in the apocalypse then like how will we ever find joy i think that's what you're trying to say yeah absolutely like i don't know i've spent a lot of time thinking about dismantling oppressive systems and i'm sure so many people who are passionate about activism have done. And I think in the last two or three years, especially with the quote unquote racial awakening um, that's been happening, I think a lot of people have thought about dismantling systems and we have to have joy because the systems that we have right now, like it, it, I don't know. I feel like only a revolution can save us at this point. Like when we're thinking about the federal government, like just the way that it's set up is so corrupt and it needs to be, I, it's it's not working. So while it's not working, I think we can also spend some energy on like what the alternative would look like. So when we are putting those pieces back together because the government is not functioning, what do we want? And if we don't have a really clear, solid idea about what we want, what could potentially work, um, that can honestly be equally as dangerous as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Charity Crop. Cross- <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> I was just going to make a joke. I was just going to say our government feels like an old man who like is so stuck in the times. It's like, it's not cool to be grumpy and toxic anymore. No, it makes no sense. And I was thinking about the one like evil. I'm sure he's not evil, but I don't even remember his name. He's a Supreme Court justice. He's black and like wants to. Oh yeah. Quite right. He wants to take away everybody's rights and it's just the hypocrisy because I think he has a white wife and he's talking about stripping all these laws away. So like, are we going to talk about loving? Are you going to get so, so, oh, so it impacts you. So you don't want to take that one away, but you want to, it's just the hypocrisy. (sighs) Yeah. Charity Crop talks about 
about the importance of, of focusing on um, what we're building up. And uh, he does highlight black women and marginalized women, but particularly black women as the, the dreamers and the, and the architects of like this new world that we need to build. Um, what are your thoughts on that, on sort of not putting it all on black women because we, we know that all women of color need some rest <laughs> above anything else. We need to rest for ourselves. We need to rest for our ancestors. But how do you feel about the idea of our perspectives being what would create this, I don't wanna say utopia, but much better world? Ooh. Oh my God. I really want to take some time to think about this like separately. I feel like this would be so fun to write about. Um, like what is that balance? Because so many women of color, we have the solutions and we've been talking about them for a really long time. And I do think more women need to be in power, like just in general. But then, like you said, we run into the whole, okay, the emotional burden is being placed on women to fix the problem. It's like, what is that middle ground? And I feel like I don't even know of figuring out like, how can we not exploit women but properly credit women and listen to their ideas and implement their ideas, et cetera. I don't know what that looks like, but that's a really good question because I think we are the bearers of our own solution and could do really cool things in the future, but I could just see that getting so exploitative like so quickly and the emotional labor just draining. I think it's like how bees work. I think black women and women of color are the architects and they dream and but it's actually the drones which are the males that do all the work that's mm. just my personal opinion and if you don't do the work then you're kicked out of the hive they do you gotta they, go they, they kick them out yeah <laughs> they kick them out in such a brutal way so um, <laughs> um sorry i'm like really having so much fun talking to you leah like i feel like we can talk about everything like manifestation of a better world and all the intersections that we all have and how we could create a better world. Um, but in your humble opinion, what do white bodied folks need to do to do the work and BIPOC? Hmm. I would say white folks, I don't know. I feel like we had a good two years of amplification. I think that a lot of POC that I know, even myself included, have been able to cultivate platforms, organizations, production companies, whatever it is, um, you know, and audiences, because a lot of people are following and trying to employ. And, you know, there's just a lot of like amplification going on. And I think that was a good first step. Um, but now after all of that, I don't know, it's just... In your everyday lives, like if you're in an office and there's marketing materials that look a little problematic or there's a philanthropic effort or something happening at your company, like trying to find ways to advocate for POC um, led organizations and things like that. And I think you can never stop learning and that goes for POC as well. Um, and I think for POC in particular, it's just to resist the urge to fall into lateral oppression. Um, it can be so hard. I remember the other day I was talking to my parents about existing as like stolen people on stolen land and the concept of reparations and how that is going to look different for um, Black folks and Indigenous folks in the United States and is a conversation that should be handled with care and listening to both perspectives and not getting into like lateral oppression. It's so easy. And just taking the time to learn about different cultures outside of your own and how we can create, you know, we can coalition build instead of, you know, competing. Because I find that a lot in the United States. And I don't know, especially Black folks, we just get the, we, like there's other movements that will spark up and then they're just like, we're the black people. And it's like, okay, we're here. We are here. We are always here, but like, we're also fighting and like, we just got to resist lateral oppression. And um, that's what we can do. <laughs> well, it's a divide and conquer tactic. That's like in the old colonial playbook. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to remember that it's like all of our oppressions are tied together. Um, so again, we have like one mission, one intention. With the overturning of, of Roe v. Wade, I think it became incredibly apparent to many people that it's, I keep saying it over and over again, but 
Uh, none of us are free if all of us are not free. And, and I think people are starting to really get it for real this time. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> I mean it. Really? I mean, something's, something's going to happen again. It, something has to happen yes. again because we don't really, really get it. But we're one step closer to really getting it. Honestly, I have heard the least radical people in my life suddenly just like dismantle the systems, tear it all down, re- reinvent, rebuild, re-nourish. And I'm like, okay, yeah. we're, we're about it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you are almost a libertarian, but you're coming around and I am proud. <laughs> we, need a, we need a movement now that triggers the cis hetero white man. <laughs> oh, yeah, they need to get it together. <laughs> right we need to like get involved so we need like an issue to like trigger them in some way honestly that would be the most funny like satirical movement so there's a fake movement on instagram that we can have as an example so there's like birds aren't real it's funny and i feel like there, (laughs) there needs to be something like that for white men that's like satirical but like they get tricked into believing it's a real issue so they get really excited um so i'll think about that (laughs) <laughs> I want to actually ask you um just one more question which is um are do you have a spiritual practice mm, that's a good question I studied comparative world religions that was my like minor in school um I grew up in a Christian household but I'm not religious at this point I would say that I'm pretty spiritual uh, my grandma's Buddhist and my mom and dad are Christian. And I grew up with both of them. Um, so, you know, I just dabble. If anything, I probably, mm, I'm more of a spiritual. See, I'm figuring it out. This is too long. I don't have one. <laughs> no, I think figuring it out is fantastic. I think we need to all be less sure and just start to figure it out because we're not, we don't really know. You know? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of just for me with Christianity in particular. I think there's other interpretations of it that are really beautiful, um, but for me, I know that it's not necessarily the historic religion of my people. It could be, maybe I just don't know. But I don't like the way that it has been used as a tool to oppress people globally. And I think again, any religion can be used inappropriately. Um, but I think right now I'm on a journey just to find. Um, what's at the heart of several religions and find a spiritual practice that feels really good and isn't actively and currently being used as a tool to oppress people in this country. So that's something I really struggle with. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like your spiritual practice is very tied to earth and like earth medicine. So Mm -hmm. that in itself is a spiritual practice and you're like a ward for this earth. Um, well, we need an answer from you like in the future. So we want to have you back eventually. <laughs> we um, need an answer. <laughs> we, we still want to hear your thoughts on, you know, like your vision and your dream. So, but we'll leave it at this for now. Thank you so much, Leah, for your wisdom and for making me laugh. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> of course. A really good time. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me. This was super fun and just keep me updated on when this goes live. Thank you.